Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Can you believe that I even didn't know when I was scheduling the next live stream with Mr. Larry Johnson, of course you know who is sitting next to me. Larry said we meet in Moscow and I could not believe that actually he will be coming here. So here we are, Larry just arrived and I'm very grateful because he's, he says he's not tired. I try to believe he's not. Long flight. Thank you so much, Larry, for finding time for this spontaneous uh, video. Good to meet you in person. She's even better in person, folks. Mm, thank you, no, it's I'm really, really happy to, to meet Larry because I think this is... I have maybe two more people to meet in person that I interview. Uh, Andrei Martiano ah, yes. and Scott Ritter. About time, right? Yeah. yeah. They've both, so, been, they've both been here and they should have looked you up while they were here. Yeah, it's timing, but I think ultimately we will meet. So I decided to meet with Larry today and ask him a few questions as far as Ukraine and United States. Because, as we all know, yesterday, February 24th, was two-year anniversary of the SMO. Correct. So Larry, let me ask you this. What would be if that would not happen if that day would not happen in your opinion if putin will not well we know the war was going on from 2014 but let's say if those actions were not taken how in your opinion the situation would look like after that yeah i, I think the united states was uh, and nato as a whole were intent on invading and pushing out all russian influence in the donbass so the war had been a bit of a stalemate uh, between uh, the folks in the Donbass and the Ukrainian government. Uh, I think the Ukrainian uh, government was prepared to launch a larger military operation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it had the full backing of NATO and uh, Russia's special military operation preempted that. So, um, and, and in that special military operation, They've, they've literally sort of changed the course of history now. Uh, I think it will only be, uh, say, five, ten years from now that people will really fully begin to appreciate how dramatic uh, this action was in terms of altering the old world order, the, the so-called world order that was dominated by the Western colonial empires. Uh, it, it, it's opened up a new face. And what the West still has a grasp is that Russia is conducting a special military operation. They're not conducting a war. If they were conducting a war, it would be an entirely different allocation of military force, an entire uh, different selection of targets, and uh, the level of destruction and death would be uh, far, far beyond anything that they've experienced. Um, so what would be the difference then, if that would be a war, officially? Um, there would be more civilian deaths, and okay. uh, the civilian populations would be suffering tremendously. You notice that right now in Kiev, you can basically go about uh, your normal life. Uh, they're, uh -huh. they're, they're sort of living like the people in the Donetsk. Uh -huh. you know, they, they hear the, the cannons, the artillery from uh, the main line, but they're not... Um, you know, they're not always directly affected by it. Um, the West still has not been able to wrap its mind around what the Russians are doing. And we've seen it over the course of the last week with the victory in Nadievka mm -hmm. that uh, I, was, uh, I was talking to Pepe Escobar about this. Uh, the Russian military strategy, I, I call it, it's a tsunami. And if you've ever watched a tsunami, the, the, the images of it, it doesn't come with a warning that, oh, there's giant waves coming in. Because mm -hmm. the people that are there on the ocean, they, in fact, they, they see the water runs away. It almost lulls them into a sense of complacency. But then as the water builds and it builds and it builds, and all of a sudden it, it, it overwhelms and overflows everything. I think that's what we're in the process of seeing that Russia is doing right now to the Ukrainian army that all along the thousand plus kilometer mile uh, uh, front uh, that Russia is starting to overwhelm hmm. all the Ukrainian forces with all of their Western supply assistance. And yet the West insists on trying to double down. 
we're talking about trying to interject F F-16s into the battle. It's not going to make a single bit of difference, but it is going to become a, a causes belly for the for Russia that they may be tempted to strike into Poland and into Romania if they base those planes uh, there. But they're not going to change anything other than create an additional opportunity to kill some Russians that will further enrage Russia and lead to retaliation. When you said tsunami, you know, that came to my mind 2004 in Bali. Mm -hmm. Like right away, that, that level of destruction. But Larry, two questions within this. Did you expect this will go on for so long or you actually expected it will go on even longer? Uh, I thought initially that it was going to be fairly short, that the Russia was going to fight it as a conventional war. And I didn't understand uh, the, the, the whole concept of the special military operation. Now, having watched what they've done over the last two years, the, the West interprets Russia's failure to launch a conventional military operation as a sign of weakness, incompetence, you know, they continue to push the lies that uh, Russia's uh, army is filled with conscripts, that it's technologically backwards, that they're having to use washing machines and refrigerators, mm -hmm. the computer chips yeah. from there in order for their missiles. And it's all, it's all nonsense. Um, what they fail to understand is that Russia is able to build up its forces, train its forces, but it's not, it, it, it is avoiding the mistakes that the Soviets made in World War II. In World War II, the Soviets still had a significant number of casualties in situations where perhaps they could have avoided it with uh, the benefit of hindsight. Um, the current military leadership uh, between Gerasimov and Shoigu uh, in Russia have learned that lesson, I think. And they are definitely not uh, in a situation of trying to see how many uh, Russian casualties they can cause. Just the opposite. They're trying to minimize Russian casualties, but also trying to minimize civilian casualties on the Ukrainian side. You know, I recorded a video today in which I've mentioned that they have just approved in Ukraine, officially, the use of drugs for the soldiers mm -hmm. at the front line. Which we know, right, that yeah. they have been doing this already. Right. Which reminds me, like I say, Nazis Germany 2.0, because that's what they were doing with the Hitler, uh, you know, strategy in this too. Now, talking about soldiers, I literally have no doubt, that Larry, and I'm not an expert, I always say it, it's just my instinct. What they are doing in Poland, they want to use human flesh and throw the soldiers, Polish so soldiers, into this, uh, right. ex to extend it, to like keep on going with this. Doesn't matter, no weapons, no ammunition, keep on going. I really see that's what they are planning to do. Um, do you see it the same way? Like, you know, Baltic states, let's say Finland, Lithuania, Poland, those countries are going to create some red flag event, probably on the border with Belarus. Lukashenko talks about it. He just recently said it, actually. And, you know, uh, keep on going, right? What is your thoughts on this? Well, so already they're using Polish soldiers, yeah. Romanian soldiers, French soldiers, British and Americans. Uh, they're listed as mercenaries, uh, but I think in many cases they're actual active duty soldiers that have been, I call it sheep, sheep dipped. So they've been they're presented as if they're mercenaries, private people, when actually they have officially tied to the government. And the reason they're doing that is because Ukraine itself is suffering a manpower crisis. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They don't have the trained personnel that they can put into the front lines to operate a lot of the artillery, uh, drones, and other systems. So they're turning to foreigners. And so this is sort of gradually becoming a war with NATO. It was already a de facto war with NATO, but now NATO forces are getting directly involved. And, you know, the Russians are killing them too, killing and capturing both. So I, I think uh, the, the odds are high that we're going to see an expansion on this, not, not a diminishment. Right. And they have to drag those soldiers because they don't really want to fight. If you capture someone, it's kidnapping really, right? You kidnap them from like a fashion <coughs> shopping centers. Well, and yeah. then you put them there and they richly refuse to fight. So they drag them now. Yeah, no, in Ukraine, yeah, they're, they're dragooning people. They are uh, grabbing them off the street. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah, and morale is terrible. I mean, that is, you know, the, in the real world, if you're going to properly train a soldier, you're going to need at least, for, for just the introductory training, three months. And then after that three-month period, you're going to need another three to five months to give them the skill level that would you know, give them an ability to just operate at minimal mm -hmm. capability on the, in, on the front line in combat. Well, uh -uh. Ukraine's not doing that. They're, they're, getting, they're lucky if they get two weeks of training, no learn how to put on a uniform, maybe learn how to load a, a rifle, and then they're thrown to the front. And it is, it's, you know, this is reminiscent in, in some aspects of what happened to the Germans in 1943 uh -huh. because the, 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 what the power of the Wehrmacht that had been on display in 1940, 41, uh -huh. Uh, they wound up getting devastated and decimated both with what happened at Stalingrad. And so subsequently the effectiveness of the German army declined because they were not able to recruit and train properly soldiers. And so that was that that decline ultimately led to the German defeat. Well, we're seeing the same phenomenon take place right now in Ukraine, only on a much accelerated scale. And uh, it's it, it's not, you know there's no way out. There is no solution to this. So United States celebrated this anniversary with more sanctions. Mm. OMG, I say, because what else can you, or LOL, I say, laughing. Yeah. yeah, you know what I mean, LOL. It's just beyond. So we have now, what, 500 individuals that have been sanctioned and I think 90 companies that have been sanctioned. Um, do you think, now looking at this, that Ultimately, at this point, like what else can really be done from the West side? They are not going to change the outcome, clearly. Is this just postponing the, the end of it? Yeah, they're trying to save face. Um, on, on the one hand, they're wanting to pin the blame on the U.S. Congress for not approving more uh, money for Ukraine. Right. Well... <laughs> Even if they approve more money, that money doesn't automatically create soldiers, and it doesn't create trained soldiers. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, and the, and it always assumes that they're going to approve sixty billion dollars, and all that money is going to immediately go to Kiev. That's not going to happen. The majority of that money will wind up going to um, the Military defense contractors. Mm -hmm. oh. You know, Raytheon, General Dynamics, uh, uh, Lockheed Martin. Uh, BAE systems, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not going to make a change on the front line. And I, and I in fact, I maintain, uh, I think that money will get approved, it will be allocated, but it's not going to change the tactical situation on the ground. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to alter the, the outcome, which is coming, which is the, the, the defeat uh, of Ukraine. And with the defeat of Ukraine, the defeat of NATO. Why do you think they chose in Ukraine? Because of the Nazi ideology that was so alive there? Well, I mean, the, actually was like, a, was like cultivated there in a way, right? Yeah, uh, do you well, think this, that's the reason? Or? Yeah, this goes back 80 years. So at, at the end of uh, the Second World War, uh, you still had these uh, remnants mm -hmm. of the SS divisions that were in Ukraine that now were considered natural allies of the West because they opposed the Soviets. And so therefore, both the uh, uh, MI6, the British intelligence, as well as CIA, began working with these you know, these groups of people. So mm -hmm. the, the relationships go back, you know, literally uh, 80 years, 70 years. And uh, then there was, so there's that ideological component. Mm -hmm. uh, there was also the recognition that there was enormous wealth potential in Ukraine. And once the collapse of the Soviet Union took place, this, there was a, you know, I call it the Oklahoma land rush. Mm -hmm. The east side. Yeah. In, in the United States, the, right in the 1800s, there was this great land rush. There's all these people lined up to run into Oklahoma to claim land for themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what the West tried to do both in Ukraine and in Russia with the collapse of the Soviet Union. They tried to rush in and take all of the natural resources. Um, they, they, they partially succeeded in Ukraine. They didn't succeed in Russia, which I maintain is one of the reasons for such anger, animus 
with Vladimir Putin because he was not going to allow Russia to be raped and not going to allow Russia to be taken advantage of. But they still had a lot of oligarchs uh, during this time. That's how many people became oligarchs. Yeah, when Yeltsin yeah. was selling out like for the pennies, right? Right, but those yeah. oligarchs were, they, they had relationships with, foreign, with, let's call them U.S. counterparts, U.S. oligarchs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Putin disrupted that and, you know, basically let the oligarchs, you can, you can be an oligarch in Russia, you can have your wealth, but you're not going to get involved with politics and you're certainly not going to sell out to uh, foreigners. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to limit foreign influence. Uh, so, uh, and, and, I, and I maintain that's one of the reasons there is such anger still to this day in the West towards Putin. He mm -hmm. didn't allow that uh, raping and pillaging of Russia to take place. Hmm. Larry, let's go to United States now used to be my home for many years. What the heck is going on in Europe? There is a, boy, there's a war of the establishment against the outsider, Donald Trump. And, you know, and Trump is a real, he's a curiosity because from a policy standpoint, um, he would be as, you know, as bad on the issue of Israel as anybody in the mainstream establishment. Um, but, he does understand one thing, that uh, putting the United States in these endless wars overseas is debilitating to the United States. And so he wants to pull back on that. Uh, it looks like he is going to win. Uh, he, he definitely will be the Republican nominee. Uh, there will still be Republican elements working against him. But uh, You I, think they can crush him financially? I don't think so. Because it, that's what they want, right? They want to crush him financially from New York. Right. And that's why the truckers now, right? Right. But it's, you know, I think he, he, he ultimately is going to prevail. Uh -huh. What they don't understand is these attacks on Trump make him stronger. Correct. And pe turn people against them. Yes. Uh, and the, the, so it's very foolish. So, um, so now there is no food in New York? How is it? Are they going to deliver? How, how is it? Because uh, to Manhattan, and I've lived there actually for a year, I cannot imagine how those people are coping now, Larry. Well, um, the, this judgment that was just passed down with one of them charging $355 million, mm -hmm. a fine for nobody lost money, nobody was defrauded. Uh, it, it's ultimately, it's going to work its way through the judicial system and will be tossed. But it's just, again, it's one other indicator of how desperate uh, these people are. You know, the, you know, the case against Trump and George is falling apart mm -hmm. because the prosecutor, Fannie Willis, has been exposed as having a romantic relationship with one of the lead prosecutors and defrauding the state. By, what a mess. You know, what a mess. Oh, yeah. They're, 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 that's the thing. Mm -hmm. They prosecute Donald Trump for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's called projection. Mm-hmm. 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 So, do you think that... New York will ever return to some sense of normalcy? No. Or it's lost for good? Yeah, no, it's gone. The, you know, the, someone put out an interesting meme the other day. They showed Hiroshima mm -hmm. right after the bomb, August 1945, and Hiroshima today. Modern, clean. And then they showed De Detroit from August of 1945, and then today with just ruined buildings, ruined streets. And the, and the word was, it's easier to recover from a nuclear bomb wow. than it is from, you know, uh, 50 years of Democrat policies. Um, Larry, do you think there will be a split as far as United States? I mean, I'm talking, actually I'm talking border as well. Do you think there will be such a thing? Certain <coughs> states will choose one way of being? No, actually that's what's in uh, Right now, the, the whole illegal immigrant situation has become, uh, it's, it's no longer a partisan issue. Before it used to pit Republican against Democrat, but now even the Democrats are hollering about it. Mm. And you're getting, you're getting more and more incidents. Just the other day, this uh, young uh, nursing student at the University of Georgia, she was murdered by an illegal immigrant from Venezuela. And it turned out uh, his brother was selling, uh, was defrauding with a green card. So the, the, the worm, the worm is turning, as they say. There, there's growing outrage because the crimes that are being committed 
by these uh, illegal migrants mm -hmm. against U.S. citizens and, you know, against, let's call it the protected class, you know, uh, normally you'd think that a young liberal nursing student uh, would, uh, would uh, be protected, but she wasn't. So uh, even in Democrat cities and Democrat uh, political leaders, they're pushing back now. But you don't think it's going to lead to separation as far as, like, will be two governments in a no, way? Like... No, I don't think no? so. Uh, okay. but, but there's, uh, we're looking at some real chaos in the United States, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So, Larry, first of all, I want to thank you for finding time. I will end this video now because my hand yeah, you know. is literally, I have <laughs> got, such a strong have to right get you hand. A GoPro. <laughs> but I trained it already for all those videos that are walking with this phone. Larry, I hope you enjoy more. Do you have some time to enjoy Moscow? During this bare, trip, a little bit? It's, it's going to be a quick, it's a quick hit. The weather is awful today, everyone, so please don't feel jealous because it's awful. Inside is great, but it's outside winter. it's like wet, snow, rain, everything at the same time. It's not that slippery yet, thank God, tomorrow might be, so be careful. <laughs> because... But thank you so much. I hope you have some really, really uh, good time here. Meet some interesting people. Thanks, wink, Anita. wink. <laughs> good to meet you in person. Thank you everyone for watching and you find Mr. Larry Johnson on Sonar21, correct? Correct. Sonar21, I will put the link right down below this video in the description box. Thank you Larry, lots of health, energy and success. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching, hit that like guys please, it helps the channel. And I see you in the next video. Bye everyone.